welcome to this interview. I'm Eric J. Olsson of Academic Rights Watch, an independent Swedish foundation monitoring uh, academic freedom in Sweden. I'm also a professor of theoretical philosophy at Lund University in Sweden, and I'm joined here by Professor Terence Karen from Lincoln University in the UK. Professor Karen, who is a professor in higher education and also the director of research at the School of Education, is recognized for his extensive and very detailed and precise work on academic freedom, and in particular for his studies of the relative degree of academic freedom in Europe, Europe at the state level. So these studies include a far-reaching study from 2017 with some quite surprising results, not least from a Swedish perspective, something which we will discuss in a moment. But first of all, and very quickly, if possible, just to set the stage, what is academic freedom and why is it valuable, do you think? Academic freedom, in essence, has two substantive and three supportive elements. The substantive element are the freedom to teach and the freedom to research. So with respect to the freedom to do research, it's the freedom to decide what one should research, mm -hmm. how one should research it, how one then should re report one's findings. Mm -hmm. With respect to teaching, it's the freedom to determine what shall be taught, to whom it shall be taught, how it shall be taught, how students may be assessed and how students may be graded. Mm -hmm. In terms of the supportive elements, there are three, tenure, institutional autonomy and governance. Mm -hmm. Why is it important to academics? Because without academic freedom, they cannot critique the existing body of knowledge, therefore knowledge cannot move forward. Mm -hmm. And we now live in a knowledge economy. In order for knowledge to grow, academics need to have the freedom to be able to question the existing state of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, let's discuss your recent paper, <coughs> Measuring Academic Freedom, a Criterion Referenced Approach which was written jointly with Klaus Weiter and uh, Quadvo Pigu Atua and appeared in the journal Policy Reviews in Higher Education in 2017. And this is very substantial and very interesting work you have produced. So could you give us a sense of the method that you used in this study and uh, how, why you chose that particular method? Surely. Um, well, this, the study actually built on a previous piece, two previous pieces of work I'd undertaken where I tried to provide some kind of value for the level of compliance with UNESCO recommendation on academic freedom, but we wished to uh, make this much more a bottom-up approach and gather much more data. So previously we just looked at the extent of compliance with respect to things like tenure and governance, but now we start to ask some very detailed questions about, for example, how the university was governed, how certain people were appointed. So one of the questions we asked, for example, was what role can the lecturing staff, the teaching staff, pay in the appointment of the rector, mm -hmm. and do they have the power to remove the rector from the university itself. But we also looked at the extent to which universities within different nation states adhered to certain international protocols and, um, and acts. And this also was another part of our work. So we looked at, in essence, five different areas, but we had 37 different questions we wished to ask. Mm -hmm. And we then gathered a huge amount of documentary evidence. So from each nation state, we got hold of the constitution. Mm -hmm. but all the laws relating to academic freedom and also higher education. And this required a huge amount of work because in many nation states this information would be in English, but that wasn't necessarily the case for all mm -hmm. nation states. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I remember with respect to Portugal, it proved quite difficult to get hold of the information in, in English. We ended up mm -hmm. getting it translated and then referring back to colleagues in Portugal mm -hmm. to verify that our translations were reasonably mm -hmm. accurate. Once we gathered all this information, we then provided numerical values for each of the five different elements of the overall index, and we totaled them up to give a particular score. Uh, you mentioned previously the situation with Sweden. It was unusual, but maybe not unexpected in that the previous early work had also shown that the mm. level of legal protection in Sweden was not really very high by European mm. standards. Okay, so <laughs> this might, of course, surprise a lot of people because Sweden is seen as the, the democratic state, you know, as kind of ideal democratic uh, society. So uh, can, is there an explanation, do you think, why Sweden would uh, not fare as well as we all well, expected in this, this it, regard? It's difficult to know. I mean, one of the things I did discover was that as far as I can work out, Sweden does not have a constitutional document per se. It has constitutional documents mm -hmm. rather than there being one codified document that addresses all of this. And that in itself is unusual. What was unusual was that academic freedom was protected in the constitutional documents in Sweden, but only for research. Mm -hmm. There was no protection for teaching, which is very unusual. 
Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I, I think it's probably unique across Europe. It's very unusual for that to happen. Mm -hmm. So Sweden did seem to be very different, but it may be the fact that Sweden has always been seen as a democratic state mm -hmm. and has operated in that way. And it may have been thought that there was no need to have a high level of legal protection because the de facto protection was there anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one possibility. Mm -hmm. So one aspect we investigate is this, uh, freedom of research and freedom of teaching, as, as you mentioned. And uh, so what would actually constitute the full compliance if you look at freedom of teaching, for instance, and, or, and also freedom of research? What is, I mean, what would be the ideal state? In, 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 in well, as I said, it, it would yeah. be the ability to determine what you shall research mm. and also to have the ability to undertake that research. Freedom from constraint mm. is insufficient to do research. You mm. also need to have the resources to undertake it. Mm -hmm. So there would be that, the freedom of deciding what one would research, the freedom of deciding the choice of methods one might adopt, mm -hmm. the freedom to determine how the results were then going to be disseminated and by whom and in what way. Mm -hmm. So with respect to research, that's you know, fairly clear cut. When it comes to teaching, again, it's the freedom to say, right, if I'm teaching a particular subject as the lecturer, I will determine what is appropriate at this level. Mm -hmm. I will also determine how this should be taught. I may decide to have a lecture. I may decide to have something else. Mm -hmm. I will also determine to whom it is taught. So I will have some opinion as to which students we may recruit to a course. Mm -hmm. I will then determine how the students should be assessed in terms of ensuring that the knowledge that I'm giving them has been, as it were, imbued within them and then how they should be graded. Mm -hmm. Now, in many nation states, for example, in the United Kingdom, academics don't really have that much say as to which students are recruited. Mm -hmm. uh, there will normally be one or two people in the department, but when I come to give a lecture on, shall we say, research methods, there's no way that I will have had any hand in determining which students are going to turn up to be taught by me right. at all. Although I can determine that the mode of assessment, again, within the United Kingdom at least, when we establish a degree, we have a validation document that is written, and that specifies, among other things, all the learning outcomes mm. for every element which mm. have, to, have to then be assessed. So my degree of latitude in determining the assessment also will be minimized. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if, if you look at the course literature, who should be in charge of the, of the, of the course literature? I mean, in Sweden, the com it's common that you have a board which decides the literature for particular courses rather than the teacher, has, him or herself. So what would be the, the ideal situation in terms of academic freedom, do you think? Well, it, in this instance, it would be that um, whoever was undertaking the teaching, they, they could determine exactly what the course entailed and, mm -hmm. and how it should be, be taught. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned having a board in Sweden. Mm -hmm. We don't really have that. We have a validation document, which mm -hmm. is normally agreed by the members of staff who are going to teach the particular degree, mm -hmm. but they may change over time, and we will get new staff coming in right. who have had no hand in determining what, will, what the content will be or how it's going to be taught or assessed. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes can lead to problems. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the academics, surely, you know, a professor of geology knows best exactly what should be in a geology degree. Right. <laughs> so let's move on to another aspect of academic freedom, namely institutional autonomy. Right. And, the, uh, and the, I know that the, the European University Association has focused very much on institutional autonomy as, as somehow the main component of academic freedom, but you have been critical to, to, to yeah, that. I mean, it, it, Can you explain why? Yeah, surely. Um, the measure of autonomy used by the European Universities Association, in essence, is an absence of control. Well, an absence of control doesn't necessarily include the wherewithal to actually exercise that autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, so Berlin, for example, distinguished between positive and negative liberty. You know, one is just the removal of any control without the ability to do anything. The other is the ability to actually act. And I think that's obviously very important. But mm -hmm. that's not included in the uh, European Universities Association. More particularly as well, their, it would appear that their definition of autonomy mm -hmm. is now moving away from autonomy for the institution towards autonomy for those who are managing the institution. Mm -hmm. So, for example, quite recently they altered the law in Scotland and it is now the case that... Um, outside members can be put onto the university board in Scotland. Mm. And this was criticised by the European University Association as being a diminution in autonomy. Well, it was not a diminution in autonomy. The powers that individual Scottish universities had as a result of the new act were completely the same as they were before. Mm -hmm. What was diminished was the ability of the rector of the universities to act unilaterally 
without reference to uh, appointed, well, rather elected representatives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yes, I think the European Universities Association, although it says that it's trying to protect autonomy, its particular belief in terms of autonomy is rather different from that which most academics right. would normally subscribe to. Mm -hmm. So you can have autonomy without self academic self-governance in the world. So, and that, this also uh, it brings us to another important factor of self-governance. So what do you see as the most important uh, components of, of, of academic self-governance? Uh, well, uh, the most important component is clearly the ability of academics to take part in the making of academic decisions, hopefully at every level within the institution. Mm -hmm. Now, when one gets to senior levels, one might argue that some particular decisions should be made, as it were, in, behind closed doors. There may be uh, confidential confidentiality attached to that, commercial confidentiality. Mm -hmm. Although I would argue... The possibility of that must be quite small, bearing in mind it's public funding. Mm -hmm. now, in the past, I remember a rector saying that one of the reasons why uh, they need to be able to make decisions was because they had to make decisions quickly. Yeah. And my view was, well, no, I don't think it really matters how quickly you decide on a course. <laughs> um, and universities have been going for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Speed was never of the essence in determining academic excellence. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it, it is today in that sense. Right. So yes, in the United Kingdom we have two basic models of governance. The first is that established by the old universities like Oxford and Cambridge, who in essence have a larger elected body which helps to steer policy. Whereas in the ex-polytechnics we have an appointed academic board on which there may be some elected members, but they're definitely in the minority. Mm -hmm. So now there's a tendency in Sweden that you include more and more people in, in, into the I mean, academic boards. So you have representatives for, for, for the, I mean, the administration and for various other categories. And in the end, you might end up with a, a, mi a minority of members being actually the academic part, so to speak. And uh, how do you see that, uh, <laughs> that uh, process? Do you think that uh, the academics should be in, ma in ma majority in the boards, or, or, or what is the requirement from an academic perspective? Well, I, I think that most academic decisions require the academics to make those decisions. I, I can't really see how someone whose background happens to be in finance or human relations mm -hmm. can make decisions of an academic nature with any credibility. You know, they don't really have that professional credibility. Right. Uh, a further problem we have in the United Kingdom is that quite often, I don't know if it's the case in Sweden, we will have representatives on academic boards from local industry. Mm -hmm. Well, although these people are very worthy and obviously know their own particular profession mm -hmm. well, their knowledge of how higher education works is often quite limited. Mm -hmm. And they are therefore, or they have to be guided Right. by the Vice-Chancellor. Uh, his guidance is often um, very well uh, couched, right. so they know exactly what to say. <laughs> I can understand that. So a further component which you talk about in your study is the academic tenure, of course, which is a very important part. And surely there cannot be academic freedom if scholars need, need to be constantly afraid to lose their positions. But even on this point, you managed to find a lot of different I mean, sub-aspects to look at. So could you just explain perhaps yes. a few of them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously tenure, which is in essence some kind of job security, mm. um, used to be in place in most places in Europe, but that now is, is declining. Mm. It was actually abolished in the United Kingdom in 1988, so it's been right. done a long time. Mm. But even in other nation states now, it would appear that the number of tenure positions is, is largely declining. Some of this is largely due to part-time research funding, for example, mm -hmm. where one can only appoint a postdoc for a, a certain set number of years yeah. in accordance with the project. But more generally, it would appear that tenure is slowly but surely being weakened, mm -hmm. and the proportion of tenured positions is declining. It does vary. In Spain, still, catedraticos, which are holders of chairs, are appointed as civil servants, in essence. Mm -hmm. They're not appointed really by um, the university itself. So right. there's a distance between them and the university authorities, and right. it's said that this does help protect academic freedom. Mm -hmm. Probably the case, but I would imagine that even in Spain, over the coming decade, slowly but surely that will probably be eroded. All right. So let's talk more about the results of this important study of yours. So, so what do you think yourself were the most important and surprising results of your study? Well, I think one of the, one of the interesting things was that not many institutions came near to being fully compliant on all the measures. You know, one yeah. would expect there'd be some, that, right. but they weren't. There, there was big variation between both the, the nation states and also the different measures we used. Mm -hmm. um, 
we had surmised on the basis of previous work that ex-communist countries who, when they came out of the control of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. they took the opportunity to write, rewrite their constitutions and protect academic freedom. We mm -hmm. had assumed that they would be near the top. Yeah. That wasn't necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, what was interesting was that if you look at um, the Nordic states, there are two particular groups. Mm -hmm. So kind of halfway up the table, you've got Finland and Norway. And then at the bottom of the table, you've got Denmark and Sweden. So it's clear that although at one stage one could see higher education policy in the Nordic states as, as a holistic, right. it's now being slowly pulled apart. Yeah, so is there an explanation why, I mean, why you would have that kind of grouping? You know, on the one hand, you have Sweden and Denmark below the others, and then you have the other Nordic countries. I mean, do you see any pattern that would explain this? Not phenomenon? yet, no. I mean, in, in Denmark, um, the law did change very severely, and this has been documented by various colleagues in Denmark, and it had a catastrophic effect on some members of staff. Um, my own previous work in this area on academic freedom caused the law on academic freedom to be changed in Denmark, but even still, mm -hmm. uh, it's the case that academics really don't have as much protection mm -hmm. as they should. Mm -hmm. And one has to ask, if one was a young, aspiring, and international academic, would one choose to go and work in one of these countries mm -hmm. where academic freedom is clearly constrained? Right. And I would suggest that the answer is probably no. Uh, interestingly, in the past, when academics were constrained by town, as it were, or crown, um, what they tended to do was vote with their feet. So going back a long way, we had the great dispersion from Paris, which meant that scholars moved to Oxford and thence to Cambridge and then to the United States. Mm -hmm. So even in the past, very good scholars have often decided to try and work in institutions where, wherever possible at least, they could enjoy academic freedom and produce work of the highest quality. Right. And one aspect of this is quite interesting. We recently did some work looking at the position of universities in the UK in the world ranking produced by the Times Higher mm -hmm. and the extent to which their institution protected academic freedom. Mm -hmm. And it is statistically the case that those institutions that provide the best protection for academic freedom in the United Kingdom tend to occupy higher positions in the Times Higher Ranking. Mm -hmm. So it would appear that there is a virtuous circle mm -hmm. between the protection for academic freedom and academic excellence as measured by positions in ranking tables, mm -hmm. which is something maybe that rectors could take note of. Yeah, that's a fascinating fact. I mean, <coughs> uh, you also note that the UK scores very low on academic freedom, and uh, so it, is there some similarity between Sweden and the UK and perhaps also Denmark in terms of perhaps new public management or you know this uh, idea that you should uh, run uh, public uh, institutions like the, if they were private enterprises? Is, is that somehow the common Well, yeah, I mean, or? new public management was endorsed very heavily by the, the, private, the public sector in the United Kingdom, also universities. They were pushed mm. in that direction early. Mm. And for reasons I, I haven't been able to ascertain, this was seen by other, other nation states like Denmark and Sweden as the way in which to travel. Mm -hmm. um, although empirically there was no evidence that suggested necessarily improved things. Mm. So yes, I can see how what happened in the United Kingdom thence was exported elsewhere, more particularly because um, work relating to the impact of new public management would be published in English but also read in the places like Denmark and Sweden. Right. And then rectors and others would say, well, maybe we should be going in this direction. Mm -hmm. Now, with respect to higher education in the United Kingdom, currently, because of student loans and everything else, it is likely that we will have, again, some kind of examination of the way in which higher education is moving mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom because it seems to be, to many people at least, quite dysfunctional. Right. So this was a study of the legal framework of academic freedom in, in the European countries. But you also did uh, uh, other studies. You did one study on the, on the uh, scholars' <laughs> perception of academic freedom in their respective home countries. And, and this was also a very interesting study. And, but in, in this, time, this time you used an online questionnaire to assess the, the perception of academic freedom. Could you just mention some of the findings that you... Well, what, what was, was unusual was that, um, for example... A large proportion, getting on to, with respect to Sweden, 14%, for example, said that they had been subjected to psychological pressure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're talking about one in seven, one in eight. And the same mm -hmm. occurred with respect to bullying by other members of staff. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens as a result of this is that a large number of academics, instead of talking out, 
self-censor. We did mm -hmm. find a, a large proportion actually self-censored. Mm -hmm. Now, one has to ask, is it possible to have freedom of speech within an institution when you know, more than one person in ten is self-censoring? I would mm -hmm. argue it's very difficult to sustain that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you compare them in the legal study you did with the, with the, with the study of uh, the perception of academic freedom, do, have you found any correlations? I mean, for instance, is this the case that uh, a country where you have a high legal protection of academic freedom also is a country where scholars are I mean, more or less satisfied with the, the way things are, or do you see, I mean... No, I think, it, in that yeah, I think it's much more nuanced and complex than that, right. uh, in that universities themselves are institutions which have a long and checkered history, and although they have changed with the times, their changes have tended to be slow, sometimes even imperceptible. Mm. So, as it were, even though the law may change, it is the case that de facto protection continues, and that may be the case maybe in Sweden, because I know they altered the law here in 2011, didn't they? Yes, they did. Yes. Uh, so it may take some time for mm. academics to really catch up with that. Mm. But in the meantime, there's a high level of de facto protection, which means that academics do manage to have some academic freedom. Mm. Um, in the United Kingdom, however, I think that it's been such a long time since we actually had tenure, most mm. people now realise that they have no job security at all. And I'm certain that does have some kind of an impact mm -hmm. on the extent to which, for example, they might stand up to uh, members of staff who are in authority with yeah. respect to, for example, how research should be done or how mm -hmm. teaching should be done, mm -hmm. in a way that would have been inconceivable when tenure actually existed. Right. So <clears throat> let's talk about something else. I mean, and now I'm playing the role of the advocate of the devil. So what would you say to someone who argued that satisfying the conditions for academic freedom to 100% wouldn't be a desirable situation in the first place? Because it would mean that you, I mean, academia would be to some extent, I mean, separate from society itself. and. The <clears throat> And therefore, it might be argued that we should have a, 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 a good protection of academic freedom, but it shouldn't be 100% protection. So what, do you, what, what would you say to someone? Well, I mean, that, that, that suggests there's a separation from, yeah. of, of academics from society, and I don't mm. think that would be desirable, but I don't think that's ever really been the case. I mean, in some nation states, they have legislation which indicates what the role of universities should be. So mm. in New Zealand, for example, there's a law that suggests states that universities should be the critics and conscience of society. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, they have a particular role to play with respect to, for example, making sure that governments are brought to heel when they do something they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they should, academics should be allowed to carry on doing that. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's a very important part of their work. And in that sense, academic freedom may be enjoyed by the few, but it's for the benefit of the many. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that... You, you might say it'd be very difficult to have 100% protection, but I think mm -hmm. that if it did have 100% protection, mm -hmm. society more generally would benefit from this. It would benefit insofar as academics could make sure that um, politicians are held to account for their actions, and mm -hmm. other people as well, mm -hmm. and even also themselves, clearly. Mm -hmm. But hey, when you talk about I mean, the public gaining from academic freedom, you, you surely mean gaining in, in the longer term and not in the shorter term. So, uh, so I mean... Suppose we want to explain the fact that the academic freedom seems to be shrinking or diminishing across Europe. So would you say that the, this, uh, this focus on, on short-term goals would be one explanation? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think yeah. part of the problem is that politicians have very short-term um, possibilities. You know, they're always looking to the next election. Right. Whereas the development of knowledge and the nurturing of a university is something that takes place not so much over a four-year electoral cycle as over a 400-year cycle where universities grow mm. and become embedded within the community and mm. a very important part of society. Mm. We are now being pushed towards always trying to get short-term gains mm -hmm. um, because the government is looking to the next election and to justify what it's doing. Right. So, for example, there's a great emphasis on publishing, but one would not normally publish a book. Books take too long. Mm -hmm. um, they're normally read by students rather than by members of staff, we would be encouraged instead to, instead of publishing a book, to publish three or four articles because we know this right. will go forward as part of our research track record and it's very important for that reason. Mm -hmm. So yes, we're now being pushed towards much more short-termism within academia. Right. So, I mean, your, your studies, and not least the study of, of uh, the legal framework of academic freedom, are extremely, I mean, uh, extensive and detailed studies. and. Uh, 
So it would be uh, great if, if it could have some kind of impact on, on society in general. So, so have you seen already that your work has uh, I mean, had some impact? On, or are, have you, are you contacted by, by, by uh, rectors or uh, governments? Um, or <laughs> well, the, the, I know for a fact that the work has had, had some impact in that um, when previous work was actually produced, it was reported in the Danish press, the mm. Danish equivalent of the Times, and in consequence of which, the Minister for Higher Education, Helga Sanger, came under uh, criticism and pressure. Mm. And he indicated that, when looking at the table, if the countries at the top of the list were communist countries, then he was glad, ex-communist countries, then he was glad that Denmark was not up there with them. <laughs> and I pointed out in a letter to the newspaper that it was the case that during the communist era, uh, one group that quite frequently spoke out against the government were academics. Mm. And there was a retraction as a result of this. But more importantly, the Danish Lecturers Association decided to mount an appeal to UNESCO mm -hmm. that the Danish legislation did not meet the requirements of the 1997 UNESCO recommendation on the status of higher education teaching personnel, yeah. of which Denmark was a signatory state. In consequence of that, the government then felt obliged by the response that was got from UNESCO yeah. to set up an international evaluation committee that met, that decided that the law on academic freedom should be changed in Denmark. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that this research can have an impact, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so suppose uh, someone uh, like myself w wishes to have to do something in, the, in favor of academic freedom to contribute somehow to the state of things. So, what what courses of action can one take? I mean, as a government or as a as a university leader, as a, as a scholar, as, even as a student, what can I do if I realize that this is really an important value to to, to pursue? Well, uh, one of the one of the things that was very unusual about the entire findings in terms of the um, the de facto study was that a large proportion of academics just do not know what academic freedom is. So one in very important thing is awareness raising. Yeah. So when you have, as we discovered in Sweden, nearly two-thirds of academics don't really know what academic freedom is. Um, a large majority of them don't know as to whether there's an official document within their institution. Mm -hmm. A large number of them don't know, for example, what the extent of legal protection is. Right. Clearly, unless academics know what their rights are, they will protect them if they know what they are. But if they don't know what they are, there's no way they can protect them. So awareness raising at all levels mm -hmm. is something that academics could do mm -hmm. and should do. And so also should rectors. Um, bearing in mind that academic freedom is a hallmark mm -hmm. of academic excellence, mm -hmm. rectors mm -hmm. should understand perhaps that one way in which they could benefit their own institution would be to indicate that their protection for academic freedom within that institution was high. Mm -hmm. Such ideals would also convince uh, other members of the academic community to join such universities. Mm -hmm. So it will be part of the branding of an institution, and I think rectors will then see the value of it. Right. I'm sure that students themselves would see the value of academic freedom insofar as their lecturers will be able, able um, and willing, in fact, to engage in discourse with them above and beyond the normal parameters, mm -hmm. knowing full well that they had the ability within the community of the university to speak in whatever way they want. Um, mm. In that sense, it has been said that academic freedom is uh, a cousin of freedom of speech. And I think we all recognize that freedom of speech is a basic human right. Right. Mm. So, Professor Karen, thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you.